So we've been going through a series called All Things New this year. Uh, for many of us, 2020 was difficult as we were wrestling with the pandemic and just all the political division and all the challenges that were going on around us. And as I was planning out the series, I'm just looking at instances where people, they encountered Jesus and their lives are transformed and they have new life and Jesus frees them. And so uh, through a series of, we've gone through a series of Old Testament passages and now we're going through a series of New Testament passages. And uh, one, one instance where you see a dramatic life transformation is in the story we're reading this morning with Jesus and the woman caught in adultery and what an incredible picture of grace and, and, and he, he truly does set her free. However, as I was really looking at this story and studying it, really began to drift in a different direction and what, what the passage is really talking about. And so we're, we're gonna be looking at not only just the freedom of the woman, but also a very important issue. And that issue is how should we confront sin, specifically sin in the world? How do we, con- how do we uh, confront that? The morals of America have drastically changed over the last 10 years. How we view God, religion, the Bible, one another, the family, the purpose of life, sin, and even truth itself has all radically changed. And as uh, as culture has shifted and continues to shift, sin is becoming more and more acceptable by the day. And so we see a situation where, where, where the lines are blurred, there's a lot of confusion, and the families are feuding, and tensions are escalating, and that's what we see today. So what do we do about it? And, and i just shown this picture up here, these two guys going at it and going fighting, and is this how we're supposed to confront sin, with, by fighting and, and going after one another? Um, I don't know about you, but any time that I try to raise an issue of sin with those outside the church, this is what I feel like. I feel kind of like, you know, we've seen these people on the side of the road and at some times or another, and it's generally not well received by those that are, that are listening. We have to be really careful on how we go about confronting sin in the world. And so often we come across in all the wrong ways like this one. And are we successful in confronting sin if the message is true, but it is not, uh, but it alienates those who need to hear it and it's not received it isn't enough to just be right. It isn't enough to, be, to just be right. We must be bold and courageous in standing up for what is right. So how do we do it? How do we do this? How should we confront sin, uh, especially out, in those outside the church? Well, we're gonna be looking at John chapter eight, verses one through 11 for a way that Jesus confronts sin. Two tools we wanna take with us and one we wanna leave behind. The Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John, disciple of Jesus, in the late first century AD, that we may believe that Jesus is the Son of God and have life in his name. And so it's written to us that we can, anyone who who hears it, and the end goal is that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and we have life as a result. Now, John 8, 1 through 11 is a unique passage. Does anyone have, is your passage in italicized, or is it in brackets, or even got an asterisk, raise your hand if, if you're that way? Um, yeah, a lot of them, and, and it's, what it says there is it says that John 8, 1 to 8 is not in the earliest or best manuscripts. In most Bibles, it says that. So what in the world does that mean? Well, I can give you the long version or the short version, and I'm opting for the short version this morning, that the text presents an accurate eyewitness ac- account of an encounter of Jesus and a crowd in the temple courts. We aren't certain exactly who wrote it, or even which gospel it belongs in, because in some manuscripts it's in the Gospel of Luke. However, there's overwhelming evidence from the text, from historians, and church history that it belongs in the gospel somewhere. We do know from records that Pap- there's Papias, uh, who's a disciple of John, a contemporary of Polycarp, who talked about this story, and he, was, uh, he lived in the first century so there, there's, there's a, this, is, this is circulating right around the time the Gospel of John is. We just don't know exactly where it belongs. So we're going to treat it as God's word, as I believe it truly is. The first thing when confronting sin is we need to confront with the right motive. And picking up in the first uh, few verses here. Uh, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. 
And so this is uh, happening we need to back up and just explain the context here. Uh, this is happening during a Jewish festival, likely the tabernacle, the festival, the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus is teaching daily in the temple courts. He's teaching that he is the Messiah, that he's sent by God, that you could find eternal life in him. And this is causing great division among the people. And there's plots to kill Jesus being hatched already by the chief priests and the Pharisees. And his life is already under threat, and we see in John 7 that uh, he's got a lot of enemies. And so uh, in, in 753, the previous verse, the people all go to their homes, but Jesus went to go spend the night at the Mount of Olives. And so that's where he slept and spent the night. And then the morning, he's back at the temple teaching the crowds early the next morning. This is really important for, for several reasons. One is that the entire nation of Israel is gathered. This would be one of the main festivals that the Israelites would have. And so people from all corners of the country, uh, even throughout the, the Roman Empire, all the Jews coming in to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And so there's a massive crowd, and, and people are drawn to Jesus because he's doing miracles, he's healing the sick, and, and he's saying things that are very controversial, and he's irritating the Pharisees, and he's drawing big crowds. And so here he is. He is seated. So he's sitting, which is typically how you would teach uh, in those days, how a rabbi would teach would be sitting. And all, there's a big crowd around him, so it's a big scene. And then we have verse three. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. It's, I'm gonna define some stuff here. The teachers of the law, those would be the scribes, they're kind of the, the religious, they're like religious lawyers. And so they, they, they would determine what's right or what's wrong from the Torah. And they'd be the ones, they'd be kind of, they'd be the attorneys you'd go to in a court of law as far as what should happen or what should not happen. The Pharisees were the devout Jews of the day. Uh, Pharisees meaning the, the separated ones. They were very committed to uh, the Old Testament, to the writings of God, the prophets. But many of them had taken it to an extreme that, 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 that was not meant by God. However, there are good Pharisees, Nicodemus and uh, Joseph of Arimathea are two. They're the ones that buried Jesus. But by and large, the, the Pharisees were threatened by Jesus and uh, saw him as an enemy. And so the, you have the, the, the religious authorities, the, all these powerful people, brought in a woman caught in the act of adultery. She's caught red-handed. There's no question of her innocence or guilt. And so they take this woman who one moment was engaging in an act of sin, drug her from where she was, plopped her in front of a huge crowd of people in the temple courts and in front of all these religious authorities and the one who created the entire universe and all the earth. What, what an incredibly intimidating situation that this woman was in. And I imagine her kind of crumpled and a heap on the floor. We'll get to her more in a minute. So they brought this woman in, caught in the act of adultery. And they said to Jesus, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They're using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. They're referencing Leviticus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 22.22, where adulterers are to be stoned. And they're really setting Jesus up. It's clearly a trap, as it's recorded here. Uh, but also, the, the, they're anticipating that Jesus is going to let her free because he's known as, as, as someone who has great compassion, a friend of the sinners. And so they're, they're setting up. They think they have him. They think they've got him. Uh, their, motivation has nothing to do with, their motivation has nothing to do with law, with morality, or the woman, or anything. It's a trap. So let's take a look at this trap that they have set before Jesus. First of all, you've got the law of Moses. You've got the passage in Leviticus 20 and Deuteronomy 22. Uh, and so they've got Jesus squarely in the spotlight in front of all this crowd, all the people of Israel gathered around, the nation and all the Jews, and Jesus had to respond. If Jesus said not to stone the woman, he would be guilty of subverting the law of Moses. And that could be grounds to have him stoned himself. And so is he going to deny what the law says? Is he going to deny that law? Now, 
Conversely, if Jesus took the other route and he stoned the woman or said, hey, stoner, Moses says she should be stoned, she should be killed. And so if she said the woman should be stoned to death, he'd be violating Roman law. Remember that Pontius Pilate was the one who had to convict Jesus, that you're not allowed to carry out the death penalty without going through a court of Roman law. And so if Jesus said, according to the law, she should be stoned, that's that, then he'd be viewed as having an uprising of, uh, of, being, of being in rebellion against Rome. And also it wouldn't be a court of, of law, it'd be murder, it'd be killing. Plus it also would have tarnished Jesus' reputation of loving and being a God of compassion as one who cared for the outcasts and the sinners. And so here's the trap that's set before them. The, the goal was not to enforce the law. The goal had nothing to do with any of that. The goal was to kill Jesus. The goal was to kill Jesus. It says in, in John 7 that that's what they wanted. They wanted to kill Jesus. And so they're trying to put him in a situation where he'd be in trouble, where he'd be silenced. But they weren't just, they weren't just murderous people. They weren't just murderous people walking around. I don't think they were. I think ultimately the, their goal was to preserve power. Uh, their goal was to preserve their way of life. They'd worked very hard all their lives to follow the law. They're very zealous for the law. And then you've got someone coming in and it's just saying that he's from God and, and he's probably a blasphemer and, and all these things. And so they're, they're wanting to preserve the system. They're wanting to preserve their lives. They're, they're acting maybe out of fear of their own situation. So, so they're, that's why they're going after Jesus is they want to preserve their own power. Their goal is their own selves. And then, uh, then here's, a, here's a resounding question you have to ask if you look at this text. And it really, it really highlights the, the great atrocity of what's going on here. Where's the man? Where's the man in all of this? Because in the law, it says that both, both that are caught in the act of adultery should be stoned. Both committing that act should be killed. And so just by fact that they took the woman it's, it's a horrific exhibition of their motives. So what about this woman? What about this woman? Well, we know several things when you really study the law and, and in reading the commentaries, it was kind of excited and, and, and seeing a, 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 this, this story come to life in ways I hadn't seen before and more depth to it. Uh, first of all, uh, she was either married or engaged. It was not considered adultery if she was not cheating on her husband. And so this was a woman, a wayward woman, who had left her husband at home and gone to commit the act of marriage with another man. And just thinking about, and all the things that are going through her mind, one of the things that's going through her mind is, what is my husband going to think? Just another layer of, of depth to this story. Uh, she's caught in the act. Uh, she's guilty, there's no question. Uh, and, and you look at the absence of the man, it's probably a setup because they knew Jesus was going to be in the temple courts and so they worked with, an, with a man to get her in a position uh, where she'd be vulnerable and they would catch her there. Uh, this is absolutely a trap. It's premeditated and they've caught her in the act. She stands alone. She stands alone. She's exposed. No one there is on her side. There's no friends, no family, no advocate. She's just settled, crumpled, vulnerable, and defenseless before the creator of all the universe and an angry mob. She's feeling guilty. She's feeling ashamed. She knows that she's done wrong. And her sins here being broadcast to the entire nation of Israel Anyone there in the temple courts that morning knows that she is an immoral woman. She also knew that she deserved death according to God's law. She knew what the Pharisees were saying was correct. And she knew that stoning was imminent. Um, it's probable that you had people already picking up stones. Um, kind of, uh, and just one of the more gruesome aspects of human nature, we rubberneck. We're drawn to things. That's why there's so many R-rated movies. We're drawn sometimes to gore and violence. And so you have all these people that are kind of coming and just out of morbid curiosity to see what happens. 
likely to see a brutal capital punishment that day. And here this woman was in the center, front and center, and she was, her life was on the line and, and, and in a very, very hard way. To be stoned to death would have been a gruesome, gruesome death. And so you look at this, and we say, how dare the Pharisees and the scribes do this? How dare someone bring these accusations and do this to this poor woman? It's just abominable that they would do that. But have you ever seen accusations used to advance agendas? Have you seen someone's sin being used to profit the accuser? I think we, I think we all have. It's just, you know, what, what arena are we talking about? Um, you're familiar with the good old saying that the best defense is a good offense, right? And so somebody wanting to take attention off of themselves, accusing somebody else, um, you're caught on the wrong, and so you, you point the finger back at someone else. Um, now we have, uh, right now you've got a lot of political mudslinging going on, and you have, do uh, you, you guys just hate the attack ads? That's one of the worst things about those even years. As, as you, you get, you, anytime you turn the TV on or, or <coughs> YouTube or whatever it may be, you're just blasted with all these ads talking about what a terrible person this political candidate is and what a terrible person that political candidate is. And so what does it leave us with? We're, we're sitting here as the governed, we're like, well, either you take one really evil, awful person, or you take another evil, awful person. Probably not the best way to inspire confidence in our nation, our government, or society, or community, or anything. And, and this whole political mudsling, well, this person's a terrible person, you shouldn't trust him. I am the one with all the right answers. And so you see this a lot in the world, where, where you slam somebody else to promote yourself, and we've taken it to a new level, where not only are they a terrible person, but you. You are a terrible person if you vote for that person. And it's, it's, all, it's all across the political spectrum. Doesn't matter what, what candidate you're, you're talking about, what party you're talking about. We really brutalize one another on that issue. And then you have, then you have the whole issues of, of, of church, uh, where uh, you know, we are God's people. We're supposed to be pursuing holiness and, and loving the Lord and acting like Christians and all these things. And, and if, if someone slips up uh, and someone is in, a, in this really, it's a position of elder or deacon or, or pastor or staff or whatever, you could take that person out, then maybe you could take their spot. And so there's a lot, of, there could be church divisions and bickering and, and battles amongst one another, even among God's people. Uh, we can use uh, accusations to advance our own agendas. Um, and then we can justify our own sin. You know, I didn't actually commit adultery. That person who committed adultery, they're a terrible person. I just commit adultery in my own heart and the privacy of my own home while looking at a TV screen or, or a uh, computer screen. And so we, we can look at other people's sins and then we don't feel so bad about our own sins. And so we even do it in our own minds and our own hearts often. Uh, and these tactics are alive and well today. And if we're going to be children of the light, we should avoid them at all costs. That this is, this is never a good thing to use someone's sin to advance our own standing. It's just not good at all. Before subjecting another to accusations of sin, we must first subject our hearts to careful evaluation. If our motives are not love, then we are part of the problem, not the solution. If our motives are not love, honoring before the Lord, then we're just compounding an already difficult situation. So we're to come with the right motive in confronting sin, but we're also to come with self-awareness. In verse six, Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. The, the, the Pharisees and the scribes just leveled this accusation, they just leveled this question to Jesus and they're expecting an answer and Jesus bends down and starts writing in the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with only the woman standing there. So how did Jesus respond to the accusers? It is it's wonderful, and the more I think about it, the, the, the richer it gets. This is wonderful. So when, when you got these really important religious people, 
and, and they've got this case, they've got this iron cad case, case before them, they've got all this crowd that's surrounding, they, they've got an audience, they, they, this is their moment to shine, this is their moment to prove how wonderful they are and to expose Jesus for the fraud that he is, and so they are confident, they're proud, they're ready to go, they've got their case, and they lay it out there with great confidence and boldness. And what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do? I, I'm going to demonstrate for you. So again, like I mentioned, he would have been sitting, right? So he'd been sitting and teaching. So here he is, he's sitting on the ground. He would have been looking up, making eye contact with those he's teaching. And so the, the Pharisees come in, they're yelling at him, they're saying, hey, this woman needs to be stoned, what do you say? And so Jesus goes, huh. Bends down, starts looking at the ground, paying them no attention, they're just yelling, just whatever, just giving them the cold shoulder, and starts drawing in the ground and and so just completely ignores them. And so his whole posture is to look down and not give them the attention they're craving. And then he starts riding. And so, so he's riding in the ground. So what does everybody do? They, they lean over and they try to look. What is he riding in the ground? What's he doing? And then a silence. And so they become more and more infuriated. And so they kept questioning him, kept pastoring him, probably elevated their, they became more animated, elevating their, their, uh, their inquiries, because again, here we've got this great crowd, they've got, he's got, an, they've got an ironclad case, and here Jesus is just straight ignoring them. It's like, how many of you, when you, you take a really important question to somebody, how would you feel if they just pull their phone out and just start not making eye contact and just doing whatever? I never do this at home, never do this to my wife especially, never. <laughs> Use it without sin. And she still loves me anyway. And so, so this is Jesus, what Jesus is doing. And then he says the famous words. He straightened up, looked at them, and leveled them with a conditional permission. A conditional permission. He who has not sinned can cast the first stone. He who has not sinned may cast the first stone. Now this is taken wildly out of context. I mean, how many of you have heard that? This is something everyone loves to quote. He who has not sinned cast the first stone. Well, let's think about this practically. So if Jesus means that only people who are sinless are able to enact the law of Moses, that is a wrong interpretation. Jesus is not saying, if you've never done anything wrong ever in your life, you, uh, then, you then have the right to c- commit capital punishment. He's not saying that. If he was saying that, he'd be upending the entire law of Moses. So what is he saying? Well, I think we get, a, we get a good clue from Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6 and 7. That the act of casting a stone was to be done by the witnesses. And so you must have at least two to three witnesses of the crime. And so the witnesses were the first to cast the stone. And so he's speaking directly to these, these accusers, these religious leaders and authorities and scribes. And he's telling them, and I believe this is what he's telling them, He's saying, if you do not have murderous intentions in your heart, if you're doing this because you love the law, or, or if you're doing this because you love God, because you're, you, you really are zealous that evil be purged from the land, then okay, you can throw a stone. I really believe that he's saying it, it, that anyone who's not sinned, who's not sinning right now in the manner that you're accusing this woman and accusing me, if there's no sin in your heart right now, you can cast the first stone. He was without sin in his heart. He was with true regard for the law. They cast the first stone. And so he got him. And so then, what does he do? He stoops back down and starts writing on the ground again. A wonderful act of mercy to that woman. Because uh, the tension would have been on this woman's guilt, on her shame. And, and on the future, and their intention would be to stone her, and then Jesus confuses everybody, distracts everybody, and takes the spotlight off of this poor woman and directs it on himself. And then after leveling them with the he was not sin, cast the first stone, then he went back to writing again. Now why did the accusers leave? How, how, why was it that, 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 that they all left? How, how did this trigger then? And Jesus had, had busted through another catch-22. 
that the trap had failed. There's no use for them hanging around. The game was up. Is that Jesus knew their hearts. He knew what it had done. He knew that they had, this was a trap. It was not a real inquiry into faithfulness or truth or love. And they'd been called out about it. And so there's no use hanging around. And their, their persistence in pestering Jesus about the woman only served to expose their true intentions then highlighted by Jesus revealing that they were all sinners and they were sinning and they had murderous intent in their hearts. Their wickedness was exposed for all to see. And so then the older ones, the wiser ones, the experienced ones knew to hang around would only prolong their own exposed shame. You know, the smart ones had been down there. They, they knew that this was not going to end well. And so you have the older leaving and the young, zealous ones understanding that, hey, the older guys are leaving, maybe it's time to give it up ourselves. Should we reflect on our own sins before confronting others? Because that would have saved the Pharisees a lot of trouble here. Why should we reflect on our own sins before confronting others? Well, because we're told to. Jesus tells us to in the Beatitudes, in Matthew, Matthew 7, uh, specifically uh, 1 to 5. Uh, do unto others as, you, as you'd have them do unto you. Uh, it says here, uh, do not judge, for you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. The same measure you use will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's very important that, that as we confront sin in others, whether inside the church, outside the church, it's very important that we first look at ourselves and consider our own motives and consider our own heart. Now, practically speaking, why is it important? Jesus tells us to, it's a commandment, but, but think about this. Uh, have you ever gotten something caught in your eye? Uh, everyone has, Right? So I hope everyone, are you still with me? Nod yes, yes, you with me? You've got, you've got like a little splinter, a little piece of dust, or, or, or you know, and, and, and during spring, you've got the pollen comes and lands in the corner of your eye and make your eyes water and all that. It's pretty hard to see, right? Start rubbing your eyes and they turn red and the, your vision becomes blurry when you've got a speck in your eye. And your vision is completely non-existent if you've had a log in your eye or a plank in your eye. And so, there's spiritual blindness. Sin causes spiritual blindness, rendering us incapable of encouraging, exhorting others in their own sin and encouraging them to leave the life of sin. So sin causes spiritual blindness, distorting our vision. We can't see clearly when sin is corrupting our hearts. But beyond that, it just escalates division. It escalates conflict, doesn't it? Causes, causing division, hurt feelings, breaking relationships. The argument turns into, an, instead of an argument over a desire for holiness, it becomes an argument over, over whose sin is worse, over whose sin is greater, and pitting one person against another. And it's very, very ugly. And we can avoid that if we first, in humility, pray that the Lord search our hearts as Psalm 139 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me in my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What a great prayer to pray before we go out and confront others' sins. We must confront others with great humility. All of us deserve death because we stand condemned by, by our sin before a holy God. It is only the blood of Jesus, only by the blood of Jesus that we are healed. And, and again, in these, in these first two sections with right motive and with self-awareness, we see the Pharisees give us a classic example of what not to do. They did not have the right motive. They did not have self-awareness or humility in their own hearts. Then Jesus gives us the third one. We approach without condemnation. In verse 10, now Jesus straightened up and asked the woman, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and leave your life of sin. 
So what an incredible picture here. You have this angry mob and these accusers pointing out the, the faults, the failures, the shame of this woman. And they all, Jesus scares them all off. And now it's just the two of them alone. And finally, Jesus addresses her. So how does he respond to the accused? There's some really, really important things we've got to pick up in how Jesus responds to this woman. First of all, he did not condone her sin. He did not condone her sin. He didn't say, it's all right, honey. Uh, That's okay. Uh, You had the the lesser sin here. They're guilty of greater sin. Um, You're okay. He didn't say that. He didn't argue her innocence. He didn't even argue that she didn't deserve death. He's not saying adultery is okay. He is not saying sin doesn't have consequences. He did not condone her. But also at the same time, he did not condemn her. So who is the only one capable of, con- of condemning this woman? Would have been Jesus. He was the only one there. And being omnipotent and all-powerful, you gotta, I'd, say the, I'd say the creator of all the universe would, would qualify as a witness. Jesus was the one that was capable of condemning her, and yet he didn't. Why? Why did Jesus not condemn this woman? Why did Jesus not condemn this woman? Was it because she was treated unfairly? Was it because she was a really good person? Certainly wasn't a very good wife. Why was it that Jesus did not condemn this woman when he had every reason to? Well, the answer is simple. Pure grace. Everything that she did, she deserved death. And Jesus, knowing the punishment for her sin was death, decided that he was not going to condemn her to death because he is a gracious God, compassionate and a loving God. Now, one of the really cool things about this that it's it's easy to miss is that Jesus followed the law. Jesus followed the law here, both the Jewish law and the Roman law. It's, again, it says in Deuteronomy 17 that on the, on the testimony of two to three eyewitnesses, she could have faced justice. But there were no witnesses there. No one wanting her justice being done. And so he scared off all the accusers. And so Jesus followed the law by scaring off the accusers. And, and so he did not violate the, the law of Moses and he didn't upend that at all. That's just wonderful. And he also followed the Roman law by not condemning someone to death without a Roman trial. Above all, he treated this woman with great compassion, speaking to her tenderly, respectfully. Uh, The word that's used here, woman, is the same way that he dressed his own mother. And so it's with great tenderness, compassion. It's not at all a slur when he he says that to her. So he would have spoken to her tenderly, woman, sweet lady. He would have said it that way, perhaps. But let's examine the content of his message. What does it mean to leave your life of sin? What does it mean to leave your life of sin? It means repentance. Repentance. It was amazing that Jesus got her off the hook and that she was no longer a dead woman. That's amazing. It's wonderful. But he didn't leave her there. He didn't leave her in her sin. He exhorted her to leave her way of life and called her to repentance. Repentance is a changed mindset, a changed heart. It's a changed way of living and a lifestyle. It's turning from sin. It's admitting the wrongness, not making any excuses, and leaving the past in the past. He's leaving that behind. Leave your life of sin. And this was, this was out of a great compassion that he was saying these things. You think about it. Adultery is, adultery is death. It's and even if it's not against the law to commit adultery, it causes massive chaos and broken hearts, broken relationships, broken families. Even if she, quote, got away with it, you're still living a life of fear, of conflict, of emptiness, turning to, to fulfillment, that kind of life, not finding any. And so if she was to continue in that lifestyle, she might as well have been killed right there. But Jesus calls her to leave the life of sin, adultery, leads to death and destruction. But all sin, all sin leads to death. All sin leads to condemnation who stand before God. 
uh, guilty of imperfection, guilty of any bad thought, bad word, bad action, selfish motive. In Romans 6.23, the familiar passage is that the wages of sin is death. And so in the same way that this woman was guilty of death because she committed adultery, well, that time when I had a bad thought, when I had an angry thought, whoever, a politician or a driver, whoever it was, at that instance, I have sinned with my anger. And that makes me imperfect and not worthy of standing before God. Um, All sin leads to death. It leads to death physically. Uh, Look at uh, Genesis uh, chapter 3. And because of the the sin of Adam and Eve, that brought sin and death into the world. And bringing uh, physical death. It brings relational death as well. Because when we sin, we're breaking relationships with God and with one another. And when, when we lie, cheat, steal, do whatever it is, we're damaging our relationships with those around us. And so it causes not only physical death, relational death. Uh, as we do these things, it causes spiritual death as we turn away from the only one that can give us hope and healing and joy and peace. And we turn to other things to try to fulfill that. And God's created us to know him, to obey him, to serve him, to have fellowship with him. And when we reject him and we pursue things of the world, we're having our own spiritual death and discouragement, depre- depression, all these things. And, and not only is it physical, relational, and spiritual death, but it's eternal death. Because if we pursue these things and we don't repent and turn to Jesus, then we stand condemned before God for all eternity for all of our sin. What does it mean to leave your life of sin? It means new life. It means new life. Because all, all these things are true. Repentance, turning away from death, turning away from sin. But also it's true in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. He's calling us to new life. He's he's saying to this woman, it's a new day, it's a new dawn. You have new opportunities in front of you. You don't have to live this way, you can come to me. And it's it's really funny that for all their horrible intentions, these wicked religious authorities, these wicked scribes, did they not do the best thing possible for this woman? They did the best thing possible. They took this woman from her sin and brought her before Jesus. Isn't that awesome? That's perfect. So God uses even our sin, even uses bad intentions to accomplish his will. And so in a a really amazing twist of fate, they did the best thing for the woman, remove her from the sin and bring her to Jesus. And, 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 and for those of us in Christ, we have a wonderful uh, reassurance in Romans 8, 1 to 2. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Even though we deserve death, we deserve death spiritually, relation, relationally, physically, for all eternity, Jesus does not stand in condemnation over us. Because through Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set us free from the law of sin and death. And Jesus took the punishment we deserve for our sin, giving us new life. See, Jesus calls us to himself. He calls us to himself. He calls us away from lives of hopelessness and death. He holds no condemnation for those, for anyone who places their trust in him for forgiveness of sins. And then the Holy Spirit transforms our lives into his likeness. Uh, It's always really sad when we expect the world not to act like the world. The only difference between me and the worst sinner out there is I've got the Holy Spirit in me who's convicting me, giving me wisdom, a desire to be holy. And and just that's the only difference between us and someone who doesn't have Christ is the the Holy Spirit is in us and he's not in them. And so we're we're not to condemn them for their sin, we're to call them to Christ and trust that that the Holy Spirit's gonna transform their lives. So how should we confront those caught in sin? Just wanting to circle back and answer the question we asked at the front. Well, with a loving motive. And there are, our motives have got to be love. Our motive cannot be, this person does this sin, it's gross, I don't like it, it needs to stop. Um, we have to have a loving motive. Uh, we need to have a humble heart, understanding that there, there but the grace of God go I. And humility, understanding that we deserve death, and so therefore we should be compassionate and how we approach others. It needs to be gospel-oriented and how we approach. That, that our primary goal is to tell the sinners about Jesus, to tell those that are engaged in, in wayward, uh, wayward ways of life 
that they can find all their hopes and dreams and all their longings fulfilled in the person of Jesus for all eternity. And then uh, we haven't talked about though, how, do we, how do we confront those caught in sin within the church, and I preached on it a couple years ago. Uh, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. In Matthew 18, 15 to 17, we see how we're to confront our brother or sister who's in sin, which is different than how we, could, how we confront someone from the world. Uh, Galatians 6, 1 gives us also really good uh, guidance on this. Uh, uh, Paul says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. And so when you read Matthew 18, 15 to 17, and I'll talk about it in just a moment, it's with great compassion. We're not pointing out someone else's sin in the church because that's going to increase our standing because it's going to weaken their position in the church and increase our power. That's not, there's so many church divisions that happen over that. So the way, the way we do it is with love. But first you go alone. I'll just read the passage and then I'll talk about it. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So first you go alone, and, and when you look at the tenses here in Greek, it's an ongoing and present matter. And so uh, if someone sins against you, you don't just have a 15-minute conversation with them on the phone, hang up, and then escalate it. It's, a, it's an ongoing desire to, to bring restoration. And if restoration is not possible, then you bring a third party you don't, bring your, you don't bring your buddy along and, and try to game up on the person. You bring an, a, a, a respected third party. So bring another. So first you go alone, then you bring another. Uh, but if they, will, if they still refuse to listen, take it to the church. And here I, I, I interpret this as not, taking, not dragging them up in front of the pulpit up here and having them confess their sin, but taking it to the authorities of the church, which would be the elders or deacons, um, to continue to preserve the privacy of the person. And then the end result is not that you break the relationship, the end result is that you not give up on them. The end result is that, it says right here, um, if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Well, how do you treat a pagan or tax collector? You love them, and you tell them about Jesus. And so if someone is harboring habitual sin in their hearts, even a brother or sister here, uh, the end result would be that we exclude them from leadership positions, and depending upon the the threat maybe from the church itself. And so next steps as far as, as, far as uh, confronting sin within the church body, commit to following the biblical model of reconciliation, love, go alone, bring another, validate those concerns with the, with the church leadership and then exclude. Uh, secondly is accept loving correction. Is just understand that it's really important that we be open to rebuke, that when someone is telling us that we're sinning, uh, the best response would be to say, I'll pray about that. I'll think about that. They're, do, they're doing us a favor. We've got to give each other the benefit of the doubt. And then we, it's really important to redirect concerns appropriately. So if someone comes to you about somebody else's sin, please redirect them back to that person. Because if you don't, you are an un- unwitting, an unwilling participant in gossip. So redirect the person to whoever it is and engage in meaningful church relationships. Okay, so that's a, a real quick primer on how do you handle sin within the church. Uh, I want to circle back again <laughs> to that first question of why should we confront those caught in sin? I want to, or how should we confront those caught in sin? Uh, let's rephrase the question a little bit. Why? Why should we love? Why should we confront? Why should we love those caught in sin? Is this really worth it? It's, it's, really, it's really a challenge. Um, why shouldn't we just remain in our comfortable Christian bubbles and not say anything about the sin of the world. It's because do we love the sinners? Do we love the sinners? Do we care about them? You see somebody that's caught in, and we'll use something like a, a drug addiction, I think that's pretty, uh, that's pretty non-controversial. So if someone's caught in a drug addiction and they just keep going back to the same thing for hit after hit after hit. It's devastating them in their job. It's devastating them with their families. It's devastating them physically. And they're really caught in that. Their life is spiraling down. How can we not want to intervene? How can we not say something? If we love that person, we want to, we want to confront them about that. We don't confront them saying, hey, that's wrong. You need to stop it right now. You say, hey, I love you. 
is there something I can do to help you in this? Uh, can I help you get out of this? And so our motive has got to be for the love of the sinners. Uh, Jesus confronted the woman caught in her sin. He just did it properly. He did it gently. The woman knew that Jesus was loving her with his words. You also do it for the love of society, love of a culture as a whole. God is not going to honor nations that turn their back on him and his morals. And we want the prosperity of all. We want all to be encouraged, all to be loved. We want the safety of our children, the safety of our communities. And so we do it not just for love of the sinner, but also for, for society. And this is hard. This is really hard. Because it's so easy for us just to sit and condemn or to throw stones, to pop up on social media, how dare that person who voted this way do that thing, or this person who holds that lifestyle live that way, how can they do that, how dare they do that? But we need to, in denial of self, take up our cross and follow the Lord. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will save it. And so we're not called to just sit in a Christian bubble and say nothing and do nothing. And I think a lot of uh, um, the church in Germany, it's, it's an easy, easy thing to go back to, the church in Germany in World War II. And uh, I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his story. And, and you see the, the increasingly the Nazi government, which everyone agrees is a terrible government, was stepping in and con- trying to control the church and say what you can or can't do. That everyone's equal, but here this race of people is a little bit less equal. And, and so a lot of the churches went along with it. But then you have what's called the Confessing Church, Bonhoeffer and others step, who stepped up and stood against that. Uh, I still can't believe, it's so hard for me to believe that, that Bonhoeffer was in New York enjoying, enjoying safety. And I think it was 1939, right before the war broke out, he, he went back because he loved his country, he loved his nation, he was willing to take a stand for what's true and what's right, stand for somebody as wicked as Hitler, and say this is what the church believes, this is the love of God, this is what God's word says. It takes boldness and courage to stand up for truth. We do not confront sin to advance our own agenda, it's painful. We do it to share the gospel. We do it to share the gospel. When we confront someone with their sins, again, we'll go back to the person who's addicted and they're, they're trying to find meaning and fulfillment in their life. Use that as an opportunity to say, you can find true fulfillment in Jesus, eternal fulfillment in Jesus, and healing in Jesus. Use it to share the gospel. That is why we confront those caught in sin. That's why we love those in sin. Those in sin. It's not because those in sin are maybe ref- infringing upon our religious freedoms or on our power or on our comfort. That's just like the Pharisees. We don't do it that way. And yet so many churches, so many Christians, we do. But let's take, a, take a, a page from the way Jesus confronted sin in John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. It's hard stuff, so let's pray about it. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Uh, first of all, because we have found forgiveness in you. We found life in you. We found healing in you. That we know none of us None of us is worthy to stand in your presence. None of us deserves your love. We've done nothing to earn your love. But because you are good, you give us grace. We, like this adulterous woman, have no excuses for anything wrong that we've done. But you love us because of your grace. Lord, we praise you that your grace is free, that your love is upon all your creation. And so, Lord, we ask that we would not sin in confronting sin. We would, not, we would learn from the examples of these Pharisees and the scribes. We would not fall into that trap that's so easy to fall into of judging, condemning other people. We pray that when we confront sin, we do it in the right motive. We do it with a heart of love. A love of you and your law and your ways. A love of purity. A hatred of evil. A love of our, our neighbor. A love of our country and our community. I pray that we would examine our hearts, that you would search it, you would indeed search us, that you would uh, consider our, our thoughts, every, every anxious thought that we might have, that you give us humility, and that others, as we confront sin in them, they would see that humility and they'd respect it. And pray that we would do so without condemnation, understanding that you and you alone are capable of judging. You and you alone 
are, are capable of condemning, that all of us at one time will stand before you and face condemnation for our lives. So Lord, I pray that you would, you would cause us to be salt and light in this world which so desperately needs it. I pray for the courage that we'd stand up for what's right. I pray for the love that we do it the right way. And so we, uh, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.